Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Moore, Project Manager for the Association of Community Cancer Centers. I'm eager to introduce Dr. Jarrett Weiss as the expert presenter for the series hosted by the Institute for Clinical Immunology, ICLEO. As you may know, ICLEO is a institute of ACCC. It is the only initiative to prepare multidisciplinary ca cancer care providers for the complex implementation of immunology in a community setting. The ICLEO program provides a host of educational resources tools such as webinars, newsletters, e-learning module courses, tumor subcommittee updates, an immersed I.O. visiting expert program, and live meetings. Now for today's webinar, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Jarrett Weiss, Associate Professor of Medicine and, Sec and Section Chief of Thoracic and Head Neck Oncology at the University of North Carolina Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Weiss, is focused on treating patients with lung cancer and head and neck cancer. Dr. Weiss' research is focused on clinical trials in lung cancer and head and neck cancer. Dr. Weiss serves as the Section Chief of Thoracic and Head Neck Oncology and Research POD Leader for Thoracic Oncology. Dr. Weiss serves as the Associate Director for Finance of the Clinical Protocol Office as well. He also serves the Vice President of CancerGrace.org, a global research with the goal of increasing patient education, family information on cancer, and is an advocate and board member of the Lung Cancer Initiative of North Carolina. Now for a few housekeeping notes, please feel free to submit questions to our presenter by typing your questions in the box on your dashboard. I will pose questions to Dr. Weiss at the conclusion of his presentation. So the webinar will be archived and available on the ICLEO website, ACCC-ICLEO.org. Now I'll send it over to Dr. Weiss to kick off the webinar. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the privilege of uh, speaking on the topic of the emerging role of immunotherapy in head and neck cancer. Um, moving forward a slide. This is the content that I wish to speak to you about today. Uh, I'm going to start, because head and neck uh, really hasn't had a lot of education over the years, I want to start by making sure that we're all on the same page about the basics of incurable head and neck cancer in the pre-immunotherapy era. Um, I'll then quickly transition into the core of the immunotherapy data that has changed practice in the last year, the PD-1 inhibitors nivolumab and pembrolizumab in the second line. Um, and then I'd like to take a very specific look to the future. Um, there are many areas for the future of immuno-oncology and head and neck cancer. The one I'd like to focus on um, uh, is the integration of the currently existing therapeutics into attempts to cure patients. Going forward a slide, I want to start by making sure that we're all on the same page as to what we mean when we say head and neck cancer. We're not talking about brain cancer. We're not talking about uh, lymphomas that happen to occur in the head and neck or sarcomas that happen to occur in the head and neck. We're very specifically talking here about squamous cell cancers of the respiratory epithelium. So we're talking about the mouth. We're talking about the oropharynx, including the base of tongue and tonsils. We're talking about the hypopharynx. We're talking about the larynx. Um, and sometimes we're talking about the nasopharynx. We consider separately esophageal cancer, although I would note parenthetically that squamous cell cancer of the upper esophagus is biologically rather similar to what we call head and neck cancer. Um, and we're not talking about lung cancer today, even though there's a lot biologically similar between squamous cell cancer of the lung and head and neck squamous cell cancer. We're also not talking about the parotid malignancies, the um, adenoid cystic carcinomas or adenocarcinomas of the salivary glands, and we're not talking about thyroid cancer. All of these are very important subjects, very important patients, but they're just distinct subjects from what we mean when we talk about generically head and neck cancer. Going forward a slide. There are two dominant causes of head and neck cancer, and of course there are others. Historically and ongoing, the most common cause remains cigarette uh, tobacco exposure. Um, more recently, we've realized that 
biologically the cancers driven by smoking and by driven and that are driven by HPV are biologically very different. Uh, the most important thing that we know about these is the radical prognostic difference between the HPV driven cancer and the smoking driven cancer. What we can see uh, in these two uh, figures are that the HPV driven cancer has a radically superior prognosis than the smoking driven cancer. What is less known is how we should use this information to optimize treatment. There are many ongoing studies evaluating whether we might decrease the intensity of therapy to re reduce short and long-term side effects for the HPV positive uh, patient based on the superior prognosis, uh, but we don't yet have long-term or randomized follow-up data to address that question. There are also no studies yet showing any predictive capacity of this biomarker, meaning that while we know regardless of what decision we make that we're more likely to cure an HPV-driven cancer, we don't yet have any evidence that any drugs are more or less effective for the HPV-driven population versus the smoking-driven population or proof that we should do anything different. Next slide. Let's start with a case. A 60-year-old man with 40-pack-year smoking history who was treated with partial laryngectomy two years ago presents with biopsy-proven metastases to his lungs. Go forward a slide, please. Here we can see the historic data that would address this question. The first drugs with proven activity against head and neck cancer were ble bleomycin and methotrexate. In an era when response rate was the most respected endpoint for a study, several drugs and combinations challenged methotrexate. Platinum and 5-FU alone each had a higher response rate. Carbo-5-FU had a yet higher response rate. And cisplatin 5-FU had a yet higher response rate, leading to a cultural acceptance of cisplatin 5-FU as a standard cytotoxic backbone. By a more modern ethos, I think the most important endpoints are quality of life and overall survival. Of course, quality of life can be challenging to measure. And so if we look at overall survival, we see that while response may be better for the more aggressive, more toxic combination therapy regimens, it's actually not clear looking back that we ever really improved survival over methotrexate. A randomized phase two study showed a trend towards improved survival with the addition of the EGFR monoclonal antibody cetuximab, here abbreviated as C225. Uh, and I referenced that because I do that a few times in the slide deck in the interest of space, showing a trend towards improved survival. And going forward a slide, when the phase three study was uh, eventually done with platinum 5-FU versus platinum 5-FU plus cetuximab, we have an improvement in survival from 7.4 to 10.1 months. The first ever statistically positive phase three study ever in palliative head and neck oncology. And if you go forward a slide, you'll see why I never use it in practice. At the left, you see the data for improvement in overall survival at the top and progression-free survival at the bottom, showing that indeed when cetuximab is added to cytotoxic chemotherapy, we improve both progression-free and overall survival. But if you look at the right, and go ahead a slide, please, you can see that the toxicity is excessive for a regimen being called palliative. I'll remind you that we're still talking about incurable head and neck cancer, where I would argue that the goals of care are to help patients to live longer and to feel better. And I find it hard to believe that a regimen with a 76% grade three, four toxicity rate, or if you add in the extra toxicity of rash, 82% with the addition of cetuximab can really be considered palliative. Go forward a slide, please. So to summarize the key points here, the first is that old school chemotherapy is not very effective and that even the more modern standard cytotoxic backbone of platinum 5-FU was perhaps based on a shaky foundation. The combination of platinum 5-FU, whether with cetuximab or without, is excessively 
toxin. So I'll take a brief side point and say that while it is the textbook regimen that you will find on UpToDate or in any textbook, very few uh, expert U US practitioners will use that exact regimen. What people typically do is graft cetuximab onto an alternative cytotoxic backbone that's more tolerable. For example, at UChicago, they tend to use bolus carbotaxol um, with cetuximab. In my practice, I tend to use weekly carbotaxol cetuximab. Um, that's carboplatin and AUC of two. Paclitaxel, there are regimens uh, anywhere from 90 to 135 milligrams per meter squared, and cetuximab, the standard loading of 400 milligrams per meter squared, then weekly 250 milligrams per meter squared. And for those uh, looking for references, those are taken from uh, induction regimens adapted uh, for use in the palliative context. Um, the one I use is Keys uh, JCO. Moving forward a slide, let's transition with a case. This is the case of a 60-year-old man with a 40-pack year smoking history who was treated with partial laryngectomy two years ago and presented with biopsy-proven meds to his lungs. He was treated per the textbook regimen, Extreme, and he also read the textbook for toxicities, which is to say that he had severe fatigue, uh, febrile neutropenia, nausea, vomiting, and neuropathy, but that he did have a response that lasted for six months before his cancer has now grown again. And going forward a slide, the question to you is what should you do? Can you go forward a slide, please? So would you like to give him methotrexate, 5-FU, one of the PD-1 inhibitors, nivolumab or pembrolizumab? Would you give him a PD-1 inhibitor, but only as long as his pd one biomarker is positive? And you can choose in your own head what positive would mean. Or would you do that as long as both pd one is positive and HPV is positive? Let's go forward a slide, please. And use that case to transition into a discussion on the data that has transformed our current standard of care. Let's go forward a slide. Here we're looking at phase one expansion data of the PD-1 inhibitor pembrolizumab, also known as NK3475, or for those who watch the TV ads, Keytruda, um, in a pdl one positive head and neck cancer population. At the left, you can see the waterfall plot. That's an 18% response rate in this pdl one positive population. And if you look at the color coding, you can see that both in the waterfall plot on the left and the PFS curve at right, that there's no significant difference uh, by HPV status. Let's go forward a slide again. And let's change the case just a little bit. 50-year-old man is treated with cisplatin and radiation for T2N1 larynx and recurs with metastatic disease to the lung three months later, so a platinum refractory patient again, but this time I've made his PDL1 negative. And I ask you, how should he be treated? Should he get a PD1 inhibitor anyway? And I'll say pembrolizumab or nivolumab here would be just fine. Um, or should he get cetuximab or another alternative agent? Well, let's go forward a slide and look at the data that can address this question. Keynote 12B was a very similar uh, study as 12A, another head and neck restricted phase one expansion cohort, um, but here unselected by PDL1, and we again see the exact same response rate of 18% and a very similarly shaped PFS curve. And I think it's an interesting shape to the PFS curve that we're gonna see repeatedly in studies of PD1 or PDL1 inhibitors in head and neck cancer. And that pattern is that you have a lot of early failures at uh, pretty much the first scan, a few at the second scan, um, people for whom the drug simply seems to not help. But then if you look from the left side of the curve to the right side of the curve, a very legitimate tail to the curve uh, with some more modern uh, uh, updated data sets showing even longer tails where there's a subpopulation that seem to be uh, deriving dramatic benefit. And uh, as this curve looks rather similar to the last one, both in pdl one selected and unselected patients. Let's go forward a slide and look at the larger phase two study. This is not a randomized study. This was a 171 patient phase two study unselected by pdl one status 
and have color coded and divided um, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, data by the PDL1 status, just to show you that um, it's not uh, it, it really is agnostic to PDL1 as measured uh, commercially. Um, the responses were also completely unaffected by HPD status. Here, the response rate was 16%. Uh, median PFS unimpressive at 2.1 months, but um, again, a tail to the curve seeming to uh, merge and a second line median overall survival of eight months, again, with a tail to the survival curve uh, starting to emerge here. Going forward a slide, let's look at some randomized data. This is Checkmate 141, which randomized head and neck cancer patients to uh, platinum refractory to nivolumab versus dealer's choice of standard therapy. And the choices there were docetaxel, methotrexate, and cetuximab. And here we see a, uh, in a randomized study, a statistically significant improved survival with nivolumab compared to these standard options. And I think they are fair uh, options, uh, particularly at the tail of that curve. Going forward a slide, we see the other reason why I'm very enthusiastic about uh, immunotherapy. In addition to the improved survival, we see an improved toxicity profile. And I would say that that's one of two main points that I want to express here. Dramatically improved toxicity profile compared to standard options. The second point that I'd like to make is that while it may be better, it is not risk or toxicity free. The most common adverse events with these drugs uh, are fatigue, um, we also see, though, more serious autoimmune reactions. The most common autoimmune reactions are autoimmune endocrinopathies, particularly uh, hyper and hypothyroidism, which are typically easily managed with medications. But uh, rarely we do see more severe autoimmune events, particularly uh, pneumonitis in about a percent of patients. Um, and while uh, this toxicity profile uh, is entirely uh, new, um, it is to me globally less uh, scary than the standard uh, agents. And I would say that um, learning to manage these adverse events um, is a critical uh, subject for, uh, for further learning on another day. Going forward a slide, I want to talk uh, about uh, the subgroup analysis because you could ask me, well, what about in the Novolumab study? How helpful was the biomarker? And I'll ask you to advance uh, once more to highlight here that, uh, advance please, to highlight that even in the PDL1 negative population, survival um, still trended in the right direction for nivolumab uh, as compared to these uh, standard options. Um, and uh, going forward one more, there was also uh, no effect by HPV status. And if you try to put them together to really torture the data into confessing something, go forward one more, please. You still really see no subgroup that does better with standard options as compared to nivolumab. And so what I would say from this is that PDL1 as a biomarker, at least as applied in the two commercial uh, assays used in these studies, really has limited utility to select uh, which second line patients should get a checkpoint inhibitor versus something else. Now these have been uh, second line studies that we're talking about, platinum refractory patients. I'd like to go forward a slide please and talk about attempts to integrate these agents into first line treatment. So I use uh, the Kestrel study uh, as an example. This is a randomized phase three study that's just about completed with a two to one to one randomization, um, with the two being combined immunotherapy with the PDL1 inhibitor MEDI4736, now known as Dervalumab, plus this CTLA4 inhibitor Tremilumumab versus standard chemotherapy versus PDL1 inhibitory therapy alone. The study has almost a completed accrual, and I would say that there are very similar studies with the other agents. There is a trial of pembrolizumab versus standard of care chemotherapy. There is a trial of nivolumab versus standard of care therapy. And there's a trial of nivolumab with the CTLA-4 inhibitor ipilimumab versus standard of care therapy. Going forward a slide, let's summarize take-home points from this section of the talk. The PD-1 inhibitors nivolumab and pembrolizumab are FDA approved for platinum refractory head and neck cancer. 
And for those who prefer brand names, um, those are Optivo and Keytruda. Nivolumab and Pembrolizumab are effective and less toxic than alternative options. In the platinum refractory context, their use is independent of PDL1 or HPV status. Now, there are investigators actively looking at other biomarkers, such as interferon gamma and mutational burden. In head and neck cancer, I think interferon gamma has particular promise, but it is not yet available for standard clinical use outside of a study. Finally, PD-1 alone or, CTL, or with CTLA-4 is challenging chemotherapy for platinum-sensitive patients, and we need to stay tuned to see what that randomized data actually looks like. I'd like to transition again with a clinical case, so let's go forward a slide. A 45-year-old woman is treated with cisplatin and radiation for T2 N2B oropharyngeal cancer. Two years later, she has local only recurrence to the tumor bed. How should she be treated? Should she get one of the PD-1 inhibitors, nivolumab or pembrolizumab? Should she get combined therapy with cisplatin, 5-FU, and cetuximab? Should she get an alternative cytotoxic regimen combined with cetuximab, such as weekly carboplatin, taxane, and cetuximab? Or should something else be done? And I apologize for inserting a trick question here. My answer to this question is actually other. Um, and I do this to make a key point. This patient has had recurrence only to the tumor bed. The first question that an oncologist needs to address whenever, uh, whenever uh, counseling a, uh, a supposedly incurable patient is whether they're truly incurable. The standard of care for local only recurrence is to consider surgical resection with a goal of cure. Going forward a slide, you can see that actually de novo presentation with metastatic disease is actually pretty rare in head and neck cancer. It's site dependent and this data is a little bit old, but it's still pretty much what we're seeing in clinical practice that 95 plus percent of patients present with potentially curable disease. And the patient who we see with incurable disease um, has typically gets there through multiple failed attempts at cure. Let's go forward a slide, please. And so that's why in the final portion of this talk, looking uh, to the future of these agents, I've chosen a very particular topic to talk about. Um, I was tempted to nerd out on potential future immunotherapies, um, but I actually think that the lowest hanging fruit to help the most number of patients um, isn't so much that as integrating the agents that we do have to the more dominant population, which is not incurable head and neck, but locally advanced head and neck that can be treated for cure. And so I wanna talk a little bit about the standard of care for that population and how immunotherapy might improve it. Let's go forward a slide. So this is just a review of how locally advanced head and neck cancer is cured in the current standard of care. As of, uh, as of April 20th, 2017. So the first is definitive chemoradiotherapy. So uh, you're giving chemotherapy in 70 gray, otherwise known as 70 weeks of seven weeks, excuse me, of radiation at the same time, most typically with high dose cisplatin, uh, but potentially with cetuximab, and we'll review that data. In this case, surgery is reserved for salvage. If there's a uh, residual uh, viable cancer at completion, or if there's local or local regional only recurrence. The alternative is surgery followed by adjuvant radiation with chemotherapy added for positive margins or extra capsular extension. And there's a lot of nuance and controversy as to when to use one of these methods versus uh, the other. But for our time uh, and purposes today, um, I think this is uh, probably a sufficient review. Let's go forward a slide and we'll start reviewing the data underlying this. This is a very famous meta-analysis in head and neck cancer called MOCK-NC that showed the benefits of adding chemotherapy to standard treatments. Let's go forward a slide. And we see the data comparing the use of neoadjuvant or induction chemotherapy versus chemotherapy concurrent with radiation. And we see that there seemed to be at least a trend towards superior uh, overall survival with concurrent use 
Um, and uh, clear improvement in event-free and local regional failure-free uh, survival. No surprise, if you give chemotherapy uh, on its own, it, can, uh, it shrinks cancer locally and distantly, probably to a similar extent. But if you give it concurrent with radiation, it also has the potential to potentiate the radiation. Let's go forward a slide and look at an important detail. Um, the type of chemotherapy mattered a lot in this analysis, and each of the different paradigms of when to use chemo had different extents to which they were using the most modern uh, therapy um, that kind of confound the results there. But what clearly emerged is that if you were using polychemotherapy, um, uh, 5-FU uh, and platinum therapy uh, were the way to go, uh, and uh, with monochemotherapy that uh, cisplatin was clearly the way to go, um, in my opinion, looking as good as uh, combined therapy. Going forward one, one of the key studies, uh, a controversial one, but a key one towards establishing the standard of care of cisplatin and radiotherapy was the Larynx Preservation Study, RTOG 9911. This was a randomized study of radiation alone, induction or neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by radiation or chemoradiation. Its primary endpoint was a controversial one, laryngectomy free survival, but I show you the data here just because it's a key study that led to the current standard of cisplatin radiation therapy. Go forward a slide. And I want to review that our current standard may be platinum and radiation, but it's a pretty problematic standard of care. One problem is obviously that we're not curing everyone. Um, the other is that cisplatin is a hardly toxic agent. It is the most emetogenic chemotherapy that I use in my practice. It is ototoxic, harming high frequency hearing and causing and exacerbating tinnitus. It is neurotoxic. It mostly causes a, a, a peripheral sensory neuropathy, much like that seen with taxanes or with diabetes. But I've seen all kinds of weird neuropathies, including autonomic neuropathies with cisplatin. It is a very nephrotoxic agent. I wish I were done, but I'm not. It's suppressive of, of blood counts, causing febrile neutropenia and anemia. Um, of course, like any chemo, it causes alopecia, um, and it increases radiation side effects, uh, which can be more than just short-term pain, um, although we care deeply about that. It also can decrease the feasibility of radiation um, and lead to interruptions of radiation and radiation treatment breaks that can harm the survival rate. And so there's been a lot of interest in the field at looking for something else. Let's go forward a slide and look at the first attempt to get something else. Cetuximab is a monoclonal antibody against the epidomeral growth factor receptor. We saw it earlier in the slide deck when we were discussing its uh, application um, in the palliative realm. This was a randomized phase three study of radiation alone versus radiation plus cetuximab. Probably the last such study that will ever be conducted because I would argue that in a modern era, uh, a study with uh, radiation alone for a locally advanced patient would no longer be ethical. We see an improvement in overall survival in this study and actually an improvement that's on par roughly with what we expect with the combination with platinum. At bottom, we see the side effect profile, uh, very real compared to radiation alone, but mostly skin related stuff, otherwise pretty uh, mild. This agent uh, really has not had dramatic uptake, at least in the United States. Um, I'm not entirely sure of all of the reasons for this. Um, I think one is that the drug was sold multiple times and in the marketing, there was an in inconsistent messaging around it. Uh, but I think it's more than that. Um, I think that because the agent is so much less toxic, it is widely perceived to have less, less oomph than cisplatin. Certainly, while this was a well-conducted study, it was only one randomized phase three study. Uh, it doesn't have the multiple uh, uh, bulk of data that cisplatin has. In the southeast of the United States, where I happen to practice, the agent has a 20% rate of anaphylaxis with the first infusion. Um, that actually can be addressed with a laboratory test called the alpha-gal assay uh, that has 100% negative predictive value, but it's still a problem. And I think the subgroup analysis on this trial are a little bit confusing. If you look at the forest plot shown at right, the population that seems to benefit the most is oropharynx, U.S., high performance status, male, 
and young. And if you put all of that together, it sounds like you're describing the HPV pop positive population, um, which preclinically you would expect to perhaps be the population to respond less. But then when this data, when they finally got data, at least for the subjects that they had HPV status on it, the efficacy appeared relatively agnostic. And so I think a lot of the world, myself perhaps included, is a little confused by who benefits the most from this agent. Uh, and I think it's sometimes unfairly uh, rejected uh, because of that. Let's go forward a slide and we'll start talking about um, attempts um, to integrate immunotherapy into definitive chemoradiation, or perhaps we should call it definitive immunoradiation. This is one example uh, of an ongoing study attempting to do so. Um, instead of giving three doses of cisplatin with standard radiation, it gives three doses of pembrolizumab, the PD-1 inhibitor, concurrent with radiation. And I think uh, those of us who investigate these cancers have long wanted to continue systemic therapy beyond the seven weeks of radiation. We, we've long believed that radiation keeps acting for weeks to months after the last beam uh, is shined. Um, but the problem with chemo is that it's really far too rough uh, for the average patient to tolerate. Pembrolizumab uh, or any of the PD-1 inhibitors are really much gentler uh, agents. Um, and so we're giving three uh, adjuvant cycles out back. What about adjuvant therapy? Let's go forward a slide. Um, and start talking about that. So there were two major uh, studies done looking at the addition of chemotherapy to adjuvant radiation. So surgery has been done, you know you're gonna have adjuvant radiation, should you add chemotherapy? Both used bolus cisplatin, the standard 100 milligram per meter squared um, regimen. And here we have the European study, the EORTC study, showing improvements in PFS um, and OS with the addition of cisplatin. Let's go forward a slide and look at the American data from RTOG um, showing uh, improvements in uh, local regional control and disease-free survival and a strong trend towards improved survival. These studies had different inclusion criteria leading to confusion about who exactly really benefits from the addition of chemotherapy to adjuvant therapy. And so a combined analysis was performed. Let's go forward a slide and take a look at that. At left, we see the population studied on the EORTC and RTOG studied. Studies where they overlapped was positive margins and extra capsular extension. And if you look at the top right of this slide, you can see that for patients in either study that had both of these criteria, there was a clear improvement in survival. Um, in one case, uh, uh, statistically significant, and the other, a very strong and diverging trend towards improved survival. But if you look at uh, patients without both of these characteristics, um, you have a trend towards improved survival at NeoRTC and really no difference in RTOG. Um, so what do you take away from all of this? Patients with positive margins in ECE do seem to really benefit from the addition of chemotherapy, but some of those other high-risk features remain controversial. Um, and I would say that the best way to decide who should get adjuvant when available is to discuss these patients in a multidisciplinary tumor board um, where uh, the priorities of the patients, the values of the patient, the physical strengths and weaknesses of the patient and the exact histologic um, uh, and pathologic features leading uh, to the added concern can be discussed um, to best decide uh, what to advise to an individual patient. So what about attempts to integrate immunotherapy into adjuvant radiation? Let's go forward a slide and look at one example of such a study. Um, this is a phase one study that's looking at the safety of combining PDL1 inhibition with dervalumab with standard adjuvant radiotherapy, and if that proves safe, to then go on and additionally look at combined immunotherapy, the PDL1 inhibitor dervalumab with the CTLA4 inhibitor uh, tremolumab um, with uh, standard adjuvant radiation therapy. Let's go forward a slide and look at yet another way to potentially integrate immunotherapy into curative therapy, and that is induction or neoadjuvant therapy. This was an area, uh, the, the interest in induction chemotherapy was reignited about 10 years ago um, with uh, two randomized studies where half the patients got platinum 5-FU 
neoadjuvant or reduction, and the other half got three drug induction with the addition of docetaxel. Going forward a slide, we see the efficacy data from one of these studies, TAX324, the other one, 323, looks very similar, showing uh, improved efficacy with three drug induction as compared to two drug induction. Of note, there's no control arm here getting standard chemo radiotherapy. So all this tells us is that if you're going to do induction, TPF is better than PF. Nonetheless, these two studies uh, incited a lot of interest in induction again. I don't use the TPF regimen in my practice, and the next slide, advance please, shows us why. So at uh, left here, we can see the extraordinary toxicity of uh, these uh, regimens. Fairly similar between the, the two big studies that were uh, published back to back in New England Journal. Now, if this was just a case of short-term pain for long-term gain, I think most of my patients would be okay with this. Patients are often willing to go through rather dramatic things if it improves their survival in the long run. People will suffer for weeks to months if it buys them decades of quality of life. And frankly, I agree, I would if it were me too. But is that really the case here? Let's advance. And now at, uh, right here, you can see uh, the impact of this kind of treatment on feasibility. Advance one more, please. And we highlight here that just under a quarter of patients in both neoadjuvant arms were not able to receive the protocol-defined definitive therapy. That's a really big deal. Um, and advancing once more, we see that about 10%, either with two or three drug therapy, um, were uh, not able to get any attempt at cure. They received either palliative chemotherapy alone or absolutely no treatment at all. And so with, with this high of patients not getting uh, ideal therapy or able to, in some cases, get any curative therapy at all, it raises the concern that even if induction therapy is active and might help, um, that the failure of feasibility for some patients might counterbalance um, the disease efficacy uh, provided. Um, there were two randomized studies to try to address the question, decide and paradigm. Uh, let's go forward a slide. Uh, unfortunately, both um, failed to accrue uh, their full populations, leading them to be underpowered, um, and neither uh, really gave us a clean, crisp design. The design I would have liked to have seen would have been half the patients getting cisplatin chemoradiotherapy and half the patients getting TPF followed by the exact same cisplatin chemoradiotherapy. But that's not what we got in either study. Um, we got DA DFHX regimen, which while it's been uh, well field tested at the University of Chicago, isn't used much outside of there. And so while I do think it's a, uh, I don't judge the regimen as harshly as some do, it's certainly not a standard commonly uh, used regimen. Uh, perhaps more importantly even, um, the radiation schedule was uh, even uh, less uh, standard. Let's go forward a slide uh, and look at the results that we did get, though. Uh, there was a, a, a really high response rate uh, to the regimen, but it, you know, no clear improvement in survival. And it may be, uh, the, the data seems to suggest that perhaps the uh, increased non-cancer related deaths balanced out uh, the decreased uh, cancer deaths. That the, that uh, induction that was effective may help with cancer, but if you're killing just as many people with the regimen, you're not actually providing global uh, benefit here. And so the next question is, okay, uh, what if we look at regimens that are less toxic and have better feasibility uh, for subsequent attempts at cure, might we do better? No phase three, and no phase three data, but I'll show you an example of a favorable phase two study that I have easy access to slides for. Let's go forward one. Um, this was a phase two study for very locally advanced head and neck cancer, giving weekly carboplatin Na and uh, nabpaclitaxel, otherwise known as abraxane, and cetuximab uh, for six weeks prior to cisplatin chemoradiotherapy. Uh, the uh, uh, response rate uh, was rather high, including a high rate of complete responses. Uh, it was agnostic to HPV status, uh, and we're in the process of preparing a manuscript detailing the exact risk level of these patients. It was very high, and showing their PFS uh, and OS curves. Uh, you can look for that within the next uh, year. But it's just an example that when you uh, perhaps 
that, that there are uh, less toxic regimens that lead to higher feasibility uh, that might be further studied. And in fact, feasibility was 100% in this study. Every patient went on to the plan definitive chemo radiotherapy. And so can we build upon one of these kinds of platforms when we integrate immunotherapy into induction? Um, if we advance the slide, we can look together at one such study trying to do that. Uh, this study looks to give um, the same carboplatin and abraxanes, uh, excuse me, NAB paclitaxel cytotoxic backbone, but this time instead of using the targeted therapy cetuximab, integrating immunotherapy, the PDL1 inhibitor uh, dravalumab. Uh, and this study is making its way through the regulatory process right now. Um, it will be a multi center at National IIT when it opens. Let's go forward a slide and review key take home points of the overall talk. The formally approved standard of care for first line incurable platinum sensitive head and neck cancer remains the extreme regimen of platinum 5-FU and cetuximab. That remains the textbook answer, although many, including myself, view this as an unacceptably toxic regimen and consider grafting cetuximab onto alternative cytotoxic backbones. The PD-1 inhibitors, nivolumab and pembrolizumab, are FDA approved for platinum refractory patients regardless of PDL1 or HPV status. Despite all of our focus on the incurable patient, most head and neck cancer is actually curable. To help the most patients, future advances should evaluate the role of immunotherapy in curable disease. There are more than 300 studies ongoing or planned combining novel agents with PD-1 inhibitors. Many of these are extremely, extremely promising, um, and we look forward to seeing data on them. These kinds of combinations, as well as others such as cellular therapeutics and oncolytic viruses, um, as well as other novel devices, um, all have high promise to advance the field, and uh, I look forward to speaking about them uh, one day in the future, when hopefully one or more have positive data to talk about. I thank you for your kind attention and look forward uh, to uh, questions and discussion. Well, thank you, Dr. West, for that engaging presentation. Uh, I do have a couple of questions from our attendees. Um, the first question is, you spoke about biomarkers other than PDL1 expression that may prom have promise when deciding on whether to use an immunotherapy to treat patients with head and neck cancer. Can you elaborate a little more about the biomarkers and some of the evidence or studies that are ongoing to support the use of these biomarkers? Sure. So, pd one uh, as a biomarker we briefly discussed uh, has limited negative predictive value with the commercially available assays. Um, you can torture it into confessing a little bit of produ positive predictive value. Um, if you look uh, at uh, you look at it in other ways, um, and that data uh, has been presented uh, previously, uh, but it's still a very limited biomarker, no matter what you do with it. Um, and that's been shown in other cancers as well that it's just um, at least on the core biopsies that we're obtaining, particularly on FNAs, its operating characteristics just appear limited. And so this is a very good question. Well, if you're rejecting PDL1 in its current form, um, what will the future be? Of course, I don't know, but I'll speculate for you. Um, to my mind, the best available data in head and neck cancer seems to be the various interferon gamma-related um, uh, uh, assays, the uh, mRNA expression assays. Um, it, if you're looking at paraffin-embedded tissue, you're really looking at what I would call the ripples of gamma, uh, because gamma itself tends to degrade. Uh, but Tange Seward and colleagues have uh, presented uh, uh, data um, looking at the operating characteristics of, um, of a paraffin-embedded assay for interferon gamma that um, seem to have legitimate um, uh, positive uh, and negative predictive uh, value, uh, particularly negative predictive value, which we're not getting out of PDL1 uh, for, for PFS, and I think that's been published at this point. Um, other groups have looked at similar um, kinds of RNA expression profiles in frozen tissue. Uh, which seem perhaps uh, even more promising. Um, the problem being that who has frozen tissue on their patient, right, that, that's pretty rare outside of a study. Um, but in some form, my best guess of the currently available stuff is that either one of these 
interferon gamma-based or an alternative uh, mRNA expression-based platform probably has the most promise. I kind of wish that I believed in the um, mutational burden scores a little bit more than I actually do. And that's because from a practical standpoint, they're already easy to get. Uh, Foundation Medicine and others are already offering these on existing testing. Um, but but I don't feel that way. I, I think that, that the, the RNA expression profiling is the most promising uh, of things that I've seen the data on thus far. And then for our second question, do you see an increasing role of combination immunotherapy for the treatment of patients with head and neck cancer in the future? How would you determine who is eligible for combination immunotherapy? Yeah, so, you know, there are multiple studies um, out there uh, to answer that question. If you look at the phase one data, um, the combinations certainly look promising in a variety of cancers, uh, including uh, head and neck cancer. Um, I think it's a very outstanding question, who is going to benefit the most? Um, I, I think I might not even touch that one in this context or speculate because I just don't know. Um, I think that from a tolerance standpoint, though, uh, it's clearer that um, combination therapy is not for everyone. Um, we spoke about that while, these, while the PD-1 and pd one agents are very far from toxicity or risk-free, um, there really are still all the same, quite a bit gentler uh, than the standard cytotoxic alternatives that they're trying to replace. Um, but CTLA-4, um, in both the, the, the clinical experience in melanoma, as well as uh, the experimental experience um, in melanoma, lung, head and neck, and other cancers, um, is a somewhat uh, more toxic agent. Um, and I think there, it, it's yet to be determined who can tolerate that, uh, but it's certainly going to be a narrower uh, band of patients. That may widen some as uh, a lot of these studies are getting the CTLA-4 dose down pretty low um, and just using it as sort of a helper for the, the PD-1 or PDL one But uh, this tolerance question is going to be really key. Uh, who, can, who can tolerate combined therapy? and who uh, uh, really all, only ought to get a PD-1 or pd one inhibitor. The existing studies really will, will not answer that question because they have restricted populations. Uh, only very fit patients get on those kind of studies. And it'll be the subject of further work as well as clinical experience to say how much we can push the boundaries there. And where the, where the balance point uh, falls between uh, the, the balance between risk of hurting the person versus the risk of the cancer hurting the person uh, that we're, we're trying to prevent. I, uh, so I think it's a big unknown um, that we're going to have to wait and see, both based upon uh, trial data and clinical experience, who benefits the most and who can tolerate these agents. And then for the third question, can you provide an update on the use of checkpoint inhibitors for Nivolumab for first-line use in patients with advanced head and neck cancer? Are there any data available for this setting? Um, the, the randomized uh, phase three study of nivolumab versus chemotherapy, uh, I believe, is almost completed accruing. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, there's a similar study of nivolumab plus ipilimumab versus standard of care first line uh, that has also roughly uh, completed accrual or is about to, I think. Um, uh, until those come out, we won't know the answer to that question. And then for the third question, does survival with PDL1 occur regardless of PDL1 and HPV status in the platinum refractory patient? Yes. Um, I don't know if we can scroll back, but uh, if we can scroll back uh, uh, to slide, let's see, uh, 18, um, that data is shown. So for the uh, PDL1 negative uh, patient, um, the hazard ratio for survival was 0 0.89, uh, favoring nivolumab over um, uh, the alternative options in the PDL1 negative population. Um, for HPV, uh, it was actually by the surrogate marker P16. Um, for the P16 positive subgroup, the hazard ratio for survival was 0.56, favoring nivolumab for uh, uh, HPV uh, negative. Uh, it was 0.73, again, favoring nivolumab. And then uh, that, that, that data, the Checkmate 141 data, um, looked at all the different combinations of 
um, PDL1 and HPV that you could put together. Um, since it's two by two, you had four subgroups. And those hazard ratios varied from 0.44 to 0.82, but all in the direction of favoring nivolumab. Great. Thank you, Dr. Watts, for the engaging presentation. And thank you to our audience for participating. The webinar and slides will be available on our website at ACCC-ICLEA.org shortly. All the registrants will receive an email with the link. Please also register for the next webinar installment on May 18th, where Stephen D'Amato will present on the ICLEO um, Management Best Practice 2.0. Please also visit our website, ACCC-ICLEO.org, to download and read our latest 2016 white paper. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the week.